circle the target. Identify where you're going to dive bomb. Split S, turn over, and come straight down, full power. Release your bombs and pull out. I thought no one could possibly fly down that low and not get hit. That was the first time I really felt fear. I thought maybe this is the end. I'm Kate Harris. I'm a U.S. history teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Wally's story is really amazing. He's 97 years old now. He was a pilot who dive bombed during World War II, prisoner of war, and he's behind enemy lines during the final weeks of the war in Germany. Stories like these are really important to share, and they're very rare today. We have so few of these living veterans still with us. Allied leaders say the final curtain is about to fall on the European war. Two of our armies have driven into the Tsar as the Russians battle just a few miles east of Berlin. The front line had stabilized at the Elbe River. That was the furthest east penetration they were to make. Think of Germany kind of being sandwiched at this point between the Western allies who have gained control all the way up to the Elbe River, and then the Soviets who are fighting on the Eastern Front and closing in. The Russians wanted the privilege of destroying Berlin and retribution for damage that they had suffered in Stalingrad and Leningrad. The date I shot down was April 18th, 1945. The group had not been flying many missions, and they were just told to go out and find targets of opportunity, which means find something to shoot at and do it. We're heading back to the Elbe River, my wingman called me and said, look at that big cannon down there. We were in the light flak range, which was our biggest concern. All of a sudden, I realized that I'd been hit and I was burning. Engine was on fire. Looked down between the rudder pedals, the armor plate was melting, like an acetylene torch was cutting through it. I realized it's time to go. At this point in the war, it was pretty clear that Germany was going to lose. The German military leadership had started to arm the civilians. They created what's known as the Volkstrom. They were given rudimentary weapons to try to help Germany make their final stand. The time I got untangled and upright in the parachute, I heard this noise like bees. I realized it was bullets going by me. I looked up at the parachute and I could see the holes. Volkstrom were out in the streets firing at me. There was a path running right down to the Elbe River. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna run down there and get in the river and just float downstream to where the American bridgehead is. And the next thing I knew, I'm on the ground. This little boy, probably 10 or 12 years old, German boy had been in the woods and tripped me as I went down that path. My face was pretty well burned and my wrists were burned. I thought I'd broken my leg when I bailed out. I could hear the Germans coming down through the woods. The jig is up, so I just surrendered. The Geneva Convention was signed in 1929. These were basically a set of rules that were used to protect the rights of prisoners. They would get adequate food and medical care. They could not be used as enslaved labor. And Germany generally followed these rules when dealing with their American prisoners of war. Two young soldiers, German soldiers, dragged me to my feet. 
They gave me the motorbike that they arrived on, used as a crutch, started walking me up this road. I was really in a panic at this time. As you can imagine, I thought, this is, just, this is not going well. But all of a sudden, I had this feeling of serenity. I, I can't even explain it. It just overcame me, and I thought God was, had come to take me home. And I just felt this immense peace. And it lasted all the time I was with the Germans. After a while, they stopped and they motioned to me with their guns to get on the bicycle. Our intelligence had warned us not to do, ever do this because that was a favorite trick. They would get you on a bicycle and ride and claim you were escaping and shoot you. And so uh, with that knowledge, I intensely moved slowly forward to them. And I thought to myself, if they're gonna shoot me, they're gonna shoot me and look me right straight in the eye. had some conversation, they finally put their guns back on safety and motioned me to keep walking. Farther out was a German flak position. They'd witnessed this whole event and the captain had sent these two guys into town to get me. German staff car shows up with two officers in it. We head back, right back where we'd come from entrance to town went right along the Elbe, and I looked at the Elbe, and of course it was springtime, it was April, the river was turbulent with the melting snows from the mountains. Now that holy miracle, if I'd have jumped in there, I'd have gone right to the bottom. Pretty soon they pulled over right up the sidewalk of a house and jumped out of the car and ran the house, and left me sitting in the back seat. About that time I heard the first P-47 starting down a dive bomb run. Every dive bomb passed to a civilian felt like they were aiming strictly at them, and I can understand that. We got back in the car and we went up to this military base. Again, they jump out, then I heard another flight of P 47s starting down. <laughs> I had exhausted my energy by this time, and I fell inside the doors, and I just collapsed. German uh, misted man took me to apparently the commandant of this facility. He had my dog tags on his desk in front of him. He started asking me what unit I was with, so I summoned up my courage and gave him the three responses that the Geneva Convention required, name, rank, and serial number. And he asked me that about three times. I gave him the same answer three times, and he stood up and said, oh, you're going to be a tough guy and be brave, eh? I wasn't feeling too good about this time, about what was going to happen next. Put me in a padded cell, slammed the door shut, and there I stayed. Then the reality just really set in. You know, here I am alone, it's getting late afternoon by this time, and I'm totally exhausted. I laid down on the blanket and just collapsed. I woke up sometime during the night, and my face was stuck to that blanket because these burns in my face had started to seep. By April 21st, Hitler was starting to get very nervous. He ordered his generals to call back every man, plane, and tank to Berlin to try to defend the city. In Wally's story, he noticed that his captors had pretty much disappeared. The door banged open, and here comes a couple of captured American GIs, told me that they're evacuating this facility and we're going to have to walk. So they put me on this stretcher and started walking. The road is just filled berm to berm with people walking. It was a surreal experience because it was deadly quiet. 
but pretty soon the German half-track ambulance came up. They opened the door and put me inside. It wasn't very long till I arrived at this little house. That's where I met this German medical unit, which had been an evacuation unit, what we'd call a MASH unit. The German doctor filled out my hospital tag with my diagnosis. There was a German-born American officer there. His driver had gotten confused, and they drove into the German lines and was captured. Well, I was suspicious of him. Anyway, an American officer who had a German accent. It turned out he was legitimate. You could hear the military traffic on the roads in Russian artillery and the German artillery in the distance. The doctor decided he was going to send the nurses to the American bridgehead. They wanted them to surrender to the Americans. A massacre took place in Germany earlier in the year by Soviet troops, leaving no one alive. The Nazi propaganda machine really made sure that everyone across Germany had seen pictures of terrible atrocities, like German women nailed to doors. They didn't want the nurses to be captured by the Russians. During what would have been the second week of Wally's captivity, a lot was going on. April 25th, the Soviet troops and the Western Allies had met. Later in the week, Mussolini is executed and the German forces in Italy fall. And Hitler is really starting to panic. It was obvious the war was almost over. So we left there and slept in the ambulance in the woods, hiding. On April 30th, Hitler commits suicide with his lover, Eva Braun, and transfers power to others in his party. During all of this time, the Battle of Berlin is ongoing, and Soviet forces are really getting closer and closer to encircling the city of Berlin. captain says, we're going to leave tonight. We're going to the American bridgehead. So about midnight, drove without lights on back roads, hiding in the woods from the SS. Captain said, we think we're close to the front lines. Before they, he'd finished his conversation, a Jeep roared around the corner with a couple of GIs in it. The American officer explained what, we, what was going on. And he said, OK, just follow us. And we'd stop and he could hear them dragging the tank mines off the road. Then we got, went across the pontoon bridge to the American troops on the west side of the Elbe and I was delivered to the hospital and they never saw the rest of them again. The Russian army encircled Berlin at five o'clock that morning after we had left. And whether we were outside that Russian pincer that went around the west side of Berlin or not, I can't say. But in any event, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get out of there any too soon. Wally's story is just incredible. It really gives us insight into what it's like to be behind enemy lines in the time of such chaos and panic and fear. In wartime, lots of things happen that you wouldn't expect. When I think back, I focus mainly on the humanity of the doctor that obviously was willing to disobey orders and seek the safety of not only his men and the nurses, but also the captured prisoners. Humanity does come to the forefront. This is a typical light flak gun. Four barrels, 
four bullets coming out of there at a time.